Are you wondering? I, this, is, this is the one moment I get to have a lot of fun, yeah? Well, if you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to 3 John. 3 John. I'm enjoying these little short epistles. And this little epistle really packs a big theological punch. The shortest epistle, just 200 words. The shortest book of the Bible has more verses than 2 John, but fewer words. And so, um, but we will glean much from it. And just so you're not concerned, I did communicate with Joel about this, so I'm not trying to steal any of Joel's thunder. So, um, he, was, he was more than gracious uh, about that, and uh, he said, go for it. So, here we are. So, we're going to take our time to unpackage this wonderful little epistle um, and to spend some time understanding it. And we're also going to look at 2 John because there's some things in 2 John that correlate with 3 John that will help us understand what is going on and give us some context. Joel has done a great job in, in 1 John, and so... Um, he, he has set the table well as it relates to the issues that were attendant with what was going on in the church at that time and, and the theological issues that were a challenge uh, that folks were facing. And I'll take some time again this morning to do that as well in terms of making certain we understand uh, the context. Before we get into uh, Third John, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for this time to be gathered together as your redeemed. Um, we just sang that great song, Worthy is the Lamb, and even this moment in, in the glory that is part and parcel of the voice of those who have gone before, as they too raise their voices in unison, crying out and singing with great joy, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. We also were reminded of the fact that you indeed will hold us fast through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Thank you for that. Thank you for that great reminder that you indeed hold us, that you keep us, that you cherish us, that you love us, and you demonstrate that love towards us, not only by giving us your son, but by allowing us to be part and parcel of this beautiful fellowship, the church, the bride of Christ. May we treasure it and, and cherish it, and we thank you, Lord, again this morning for bringing Chris and Nancy Shank to us, and in your good providence, bringing them to this congregation, and, and, and now leading them to become involved as members. We are so grateful for that, Lord. You are loving and kind and beneficent, um, and we accept them as a gracious gift to us from you today. Thank you, Lord, for that. Bless us as we study your word. Thank you for the opportunity to have it. We understand that many around the world do not, and those who would love to have it help us, Lord, to be mindful of what they would miss that we might take for granted. Um, help us to cherish your word more than we have before. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's just go ahead then and read 2 John, and we're going to read 2 John and 3 John, and then we'll, we'll begin to lay the foundation and the framework for, these, for this little epistle, 3 John, and incorporating some of the content of 2 John in consideration of what um, John's concerns were at this time. Verse 1, the elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, for the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard it from the beginning, that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves, that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. 
The one who abides in the teaching, he is both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive them into your house and do not give him a greeting. For, he, for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be made full. The children of your chosen sister greet you. Third John, verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when, when brethren came and testified to your truth, that is, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. And they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on your way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself, and we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I have many things to write to you, but I am not willing to write them to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly and will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Well, we have this wonderful little epistle. Um, it doesn't get a lot of attention, um, and it's quite unique. And we have here a theme that's important to John, and that is the issue of the truth. Both the second epistle, 2 John and 3 John, concern themselves with the truth. You'll see that that word is frequently referenced in both epistles. And of course, John is concerned about the truth, and he is concerned about the error that is permeating the church at that time as it relates to an attack on the deity of Jesus Christ. It was a form of Gnosticism that basically said that um, Jesus was the flesh part, Christ was the spirit part, and the spirit came and covered, hovered over Christ, but the two were, were not united. Because the flesh is fallen and wicked and evil, and so the two could not be combined, and so they rejected the deity of Jesus Christ. And so John is very concerned about that, and, and what we would understand then from church history, many believe that this epistle was written um, uh, sometime between AD 80 and 95, John is quite old at this point in time. He has been released from the Isle of Patmos, where he was working in a mine, um, and he's older. He's much older. Um, he's the longest lived disciple at this point in time, the only surviving one at this point in um, the, of, of those who would have followed Christ in the context of being a, disi a disciple. He's an apostle at this point in time, and he's in Ephesus, many believe, um, as he's working with the church there and pastoring and also training other men to be elders and pastors in the church. So he's concerned about what's going on in the church, as he would be. And his primary concern is essential to the church, is it not? It's about who is Jesus Christ. Because if you get Jesus Christ wrong, you get it all wrong, right? Right? And so that's a massive concern for him. And so many believe that the, that, that the content of the letter that Diotrephes would ultimately reject is the gospel of John and second John. So that's significant when you consider what's taking place here and what John would have written. Now, I want you to think about the gospel of John for a minute. That's no small undertaking. It's a theological masterpiece. And its focus is, unlike it, the other Gospels tell us about 
um, the things that Jesus did and his miracles. But the Gospel of John is different from the other three Gospels in that its focus is on who is Jesus and his relationship with the Father. That's very important. And so we'll find later on as we work into this passage and into this book that this error was permeating the church and being worked into the church. So much so that you have a fellow like Diotrephes rejecting those who were bringing the letter, who many believe to be um, the, the fellow referred to in verse 12, Demetrius, who was the courier for these epistles um, and likely the gospel of John to these churches. So it's significant. Now, there's interesting characters in these epistles. Um, in Third John in particular, we have four people. We have John, we have Gaius, we have Diotrephes, and we have Demetrius. A study in contrast, if there ever was. Four people that we can look at and learn much from. And we also find then, too, like with Philemon, Gaius also has a good reputation. He has a reputation for being a man who is concerned about the truth and who is, who is wanting to guard the truth, so much so that he's standing in opposition to Diotrephes. And we'll learn much more about Diotrephes. His, his name is unique. It means the offspring of Zeus. So he's Zeus baby. <laughs> Just an uh, interesting name. But the name is unique too in that you have a picture then that's contrasted with Gaius, a man of the world, and Diotrephes, a man of the world. Two very unique contrasts to make there, and the play that they have in the church is significant as well. I thought this would also be a good occasion, as we have two young men in the church who are aspiring to be elders, to understand what a bad elder looks like, um, because apparently Diotrephes had a position within the church, so much so that he was able to excommunicate and exclude people from the church. Um, and so we'll learn much about what it means to be um, an elder and how to exercise authority in that context and the, the good things to do and the bad things to do in that way. And so um, Second John, though, is important to us as well. It's interesting, too, that the contrast between the two epistles is really important because on one hand, in Second John, you have uh, rules about hospitality, and in Third John, you have rules about hospitality. In Second John, John specifically tells you, you don't bring the people into your home who are teaching error. What that communicates to us is how zealously and jealously we ought to be concerned and guarding the truth. How important is the truth? And it also begs the question, what is the truth? What is the truth that John is concerned about, and what is the truth that he's guarding? Well, again, it goes back to who is Jesus Christ. It goes back to the work and person of Jesus Christ, the sufficiency of his work, the acceptance of his work by the Father, and the fact that he is indeed capable of being our Savior. Keep in mind, if we don't have that, if his person is attacked, then we have nothing. We have absolutely nothing. And so 2 John communicates importantly to us this principle of the idea about those who are attacking the work and person of Jesus Christ and how we need to be careful about what we do with them and how we accept them and what opportunities we extend to them. If you look at 2 John, he says, verse 8, watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Don't be dissuaded from the essence of the gospel. Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of the gospel. He is what the gospel is about. And so we want to make certain that we're not undermining the very heart and core of the message. Verse 9, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ. Now, now pay attention to this, friends. Pay very close attention to what John is saying. Because this theme of the truth carries over into the third epistle, and is certainly integral to the gospel of John as well. I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? That's what John would say in John 14, or Christ would say, rather, in John 14. Verse 9 here in the second epistle, though, says, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Does not have God. 
That's just an unequivocal statement of fact. He goes on to say, the one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. So what we're going to find out then that essential to the truth and essential to being identified as a Christian is this core principle of abiding in the truth. That is accepting the truth, acknowledging the, the truth, embracing the truth by faith. Remember, faith is, is knowledge, assent, and trust. And so those are components that are, that are central to faith, and so certainly that would be uh, consistent with what John is saying here in verse 9 in 2 John. We need to be so concerned about this core truth, this gospel truth, that in verse 10 he says to us, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Yeah, there's, there's much that can be said about that, but certainly those two verses, as we will see, then help us understand why John is so concerned about what Diotrephes is doing. What the man of the world is doing to the truth. How he is attacking the truth. We'll find out what Diotrephes did in regards to rejecting these missionaries and these brethren who were bringing this good news, this good message to the church. In fact, he impeded its delivery. He prevented, the implication is, is that he kept the gospel of John from being delivered to this church. That's a big deal. Now, by extension, it begs the question, You've got to get the truth right. And if you don't get the truth right, or if you change the truth, or if you twist the truth, if you alter the truth, John's warnings and exhortations are very clear. There is no middle ground when it comes to the truth. You either know it or you don't. You either accept it or you reject it. There are no half-truths that are acceptable in the church. You either get the gospel right or you don't. And so this goes to an issue of discernment. And so what we'll find then as we look here, and what we do understand is that, that there was a lot of this going on within the context of that time frame. Gnosticism towards the end of the first century was gaining a strong foothold. Um, it was growing. We saw glimpses of it, a, a precursor to Gnosticism in the church in Colossae. And that would have been some, well, most would estimate 20 to maybe 40 years earlier in the context of when this may have been written. And so you have this time and you can see the progression of the teaching of the Gnostics from what they were dabbling with early on in the Church of Colossae and that blending of pagan syncretism and temple ecstasy and the worship of angels and some blending of Judaism to now a more, what I would call, a purer form of Gnosticism that really does attack the very essence of who Jesus Christ is. Some of this is going on today even in the church, and certainly there are many who undermine the work and person of Jesus Christ by adding to the gospel works-based righteousness things that we ought to do to add to it. Danny reminded us this morning about the idea that it's not the idea of Christ giving us 90% and we add our 10%. No, it's all of Christ, or it's none of him. So that's something that's concerning to John. So the truth, ultimately, if you're taking notes, and I hope that you are because notes help you remember we understand that it would define truth as John would define it in these epistles. It's the right belief about Jesus Christ. The right belief about Jesus Christ, and that the right belief about Jesus Christ then would encompass who he is, what he has done, why he did it, and what it accomplishes. As it relates to the gospel, that's important. 
And so we have to be careful how we nuance things and how we maneuver things as it relates to who Jesus Christ is. Even in 1 John, and again, I'm not trying to stomp on Joel's text at all. Um, we're not competitors. We're, we're, we're working together on this, for most certainly. Um, well, we'll, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I'll get there in a second. Um, I want to do something else first. So let's go back to the third epistle for a moment. And let's begin with verse 1. So the themes that we're finding then in 3 John, if you want to try to have a category to work in as it relates to this third epistle, would be love and truth. We're going to see that John's love for Gaius and for Demetrius is great, and his love for the children that he refers to. Now, as an aside, in 2 John, there's a reference to the elect lady. My position is that is a church. It's, it's not an individual, and in that the children are the members of that congregation or members of churches connected to that church or under that kind of authority and structure. It's not an individual person. Um, if you recall, the church is the bride of Christ. It's often referred to as um, she or her in the context of a pronoun. Um, we don't have to assign it a pronoun um, that way, but... Uh, just so you understand what we're talking about. And so, again, John's concerned about these believers and not being impacted, and the theme is love and truth. He emphasizes truth in the second epistle, and in the third epistle, we see the idea of both love and truth, his love for the brethren and his love for the truth and his efforts to guard the truth and his commendation of those who do hold to the truth. So let's look at this. We find here then John writing, and it's interesting because unlike other epistles, John does not identify himself as an apostle like Paul would do, but he refers to himself as the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. This is a really unique verse. It's, it's quite unique in that it's incredibly pastoral. Here you have again, like the letter to Philemon, a personal letter to an individual. So it's in that same framework. John is writing as a pastor to one of his congregants, someone who is in a church that he is overseeing in some context. He's in Ephesus. It's believed that Gaius was part of a church that was somewhere within the locale or vicinity of Ephesus. John is older. He does indicate that he's going to come to the church, so presumably, based upon his age at that point in time, late 80s, maybe early 90, 90s, he's, he's an older gentleman. Now, now, this is an aside. Think about that for a minute. He didn't just fade off into the distance somewhere. He just got off, off the Isle of Patmos, and here he is back in, involved in ministry at that age after going through that difficulty. Many believe that at some point in time, even before this, according to church history, John was dipped in a vat of hot tar as a form of persecution. And that's a fairly consistent story in church history. That part of his persecution, and it was believed that it was intended to kill him, but it didn't. Now, I read an account one time. When I was in college, I, when I was a history major in college, and my focus was on the revolutionary era or the colonial era of America, and I read an account one time of a man who was tarred and feathered in Boston in 1775. He was an agent of the British government. He was involved in the collecting of taxes and selling stamps. And the people hated him. And so they found him one day, and they tarred and feathered him. And they dipped him in a barrel full of hot, boiling tar and then covered him in feathers. It took him two years to remove it all. Two years to get all that stuff off. He had all kinds of other complications from it as well because your skin has to breathe. Tar would inhibit that, and so he had all sorts of problems. So according to at least church history, at some point in time, 
many believe while he was on the Isle of Patmos, or in some context there, he was dipped in some type of container of tar. Nonetheless, here he is at this old age serving and engaging with somebody as the pastor. And so what is he going to do with Gaius in this context? He's going to encourage him and exhort him. He's going to love on him. He's going to love him in a way that pushes him to remain committed to the truth, which John is so very concerned about. Because again, the truth is connected to who is Jesus Christ. And so in this verse first, we see this, the elder to the beloved Gaius. So let's talk about this for a moment. Here, John identifies himself as the elder. And and what we understand is that the meaning of the word can mean an older man, but comes also to convey ideas of respect, authenticity, and integrity. In this context, as as a biblical elder, he is a man of courage, commitment, and conviction. He is a man of authority rooted in spiritual maturity. And indeed, John is such a person. He is that man. But he's also tender in the context of the balance of these various attributes. Courage, commitment, conviction, authority rooted in spiritual maturity. These are the things that an elder would, would, would demonstrate and have as part and parcel of their position and their ability to serve in that capacity. But he also is able to balance all those things with a loving care and concern for one of his congregants about his relationship to the church and what he's doing to protect the church. And so he says to Gaius, he calls him beloved. Beloved. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. So we find then the predicate, the foundation for John's relationship with Gaius is not their common um, uh, hobbies or their enjoyment of golf or sailboats or other things. It's the truth. It's the truth that binds them together. It's a love for Jesus Christ because, again, don't forget, when we talk about truth in these passages, immediately in your mind, you ought to be thinking about Jesus Christ. So when I say the truth, you ought to just say in your mind, Jesus. Because this is what John is doing. He loves Gaius in Christ. He loves him in the truth that is attendant with all that Jesus Christ is. They have that common bond. They have that forever bond. Remember in Philemon, Paul would exhort Um, uh, Philemon to accept Onesimus as a brother and you will have him forever. He is your forever brother. And John captures that very same idea here as well. Even the use of this word I is in a context and a grammatical structure and case that emphasizes the significance of the love that John has for Gaius. What I like about this too, friends, is that as we examine this, it says to us the importance of these these relationships and these bonds of fellowship that we have, that God has uniquely given to us in Jesus Christ, that they ought to be treasured, that they ought to be captured, cultivated, and pursued vigorously. It's no small matter. I'm going to say this clearly. It's no small matter that you are here, that God has brought you together in this body to know each other, to fellowship with each other, that there is a unique bond that eclipses even family relationships. My dad would often lament that people took to church too casually, that we, that we didn't love the body of Christ as we ought to, that we were too dismissive of it, that it became secondary in our schedules, that it was always something that was, oh, we'll get there if we can. It wasn't, we'll do it because we love to. And so we find here then too, and it's interesting because of even the cultural context in which this would have been taking place, 
again, this is not an easy time in which to live. Life is challenging. Things are difficult. Things have not progressed that much from the 30 or 40 years since we talked about what was going on in Colossae. Life was still difficult and challenging. And yet here, John, the pastor, communicates that he loves this man Gaius in the Lord and he treasures that relationship is the implication of this first verse. Now, for John, that's significant because as a pastor, and a pastor loves nothing more than this, than to see another person who loves Jesus Christ, who loves the truth, who treasures the truth, who guards the truth, who revels in the relationships that are based upon the truth. And so we need to be mindful of that in terms of our own assessment of relationships that we have and the, the, bind, the, the ties that bind us together in Jesus Christ. It's no small matter that God saved you and brought you here. You are not in Beloit, Ohio by mistake. I know sometimes it might feel like that. How, how did I get here? You're here because of God's good providence. And so, there's just so much here. Now, again, at, at this point in time in church history, too, the presence of a person like Gaius in the church would have been significant for Paul as a pastor. Because one of the things that a pastor wants is he wants other men with him who will also guard the truth. It's not easy to be a pastor. It's not easy to be the person who has to stand in front of the congregation day in and day out and hold up the Word of God and proclaim the gospel and preach the gospel and do so with a consistent level of conviction and clarity and concern. And it's always welcoming to a pastor when there are other men who come alongside to aid in the endeavor to communicate and guard the truth. That's what an elder does. Lead, feed, protect. And so John is reveling in that relationship too because it's a challenging time to live. There, there was error that was corrupting the work and person of Jesus Christ. The church was under attack. Diotrephes was attacking one of the sister churches in the region. It's so problematic that John in his second epistle is telling a church that you don't even extend common hospitality to those who are not articulating who Jesus Christ is correctly. You don't even give them a blessing because to bless them is to participate in what they're doing. That's a big deal. He, he sees no room for quarter, and so he finds in Gaius that man who stands with him in the face of this strong opposition, and it was strong, and it was concerted. It's so strong and so concerted that Diotrephes is able to keep people out of a church and is able to throw people out of a church who want to receive the emissaries who are bringing the gospel of John into the church, the missionaries who would be coming and, and to be received in that way. And so for John, someone like Gaius is an encouragement to him. He, it allows John to, to have a sense of, of of comfort and confidence that God's word is being preserved and will be preserved because of people like Gaius who love the truth. We're told in the Proverbs to buy the truth and what? Sell it not. Gaius is a man who loves the truth. He loves the truth. John was concerned that these Gnostics, who are often referred to as schismatics, that's interesting, these false teachers, these antichrists that John deals with in his first epistle in great extent, warning about them, and again also in the second epistle, they're schismatics. And what does a schismatic do? They divide the body of Christ. Well, the Bible is clear about 
the implications of that. It says in the scripture, woe unto those who spread discord among the brethren. And that's what these schismatics were doing, to drive a wedge, to make a schism, to divide. And they were deep divides. So much so that Diotrephes had a position of power and was able to control that church in its receipt of a letter from (laughs) John, of all people. So, he looks at Gaius and he sees a man who is not schismatic, who is not divisive, who is protecting the unity of the church, who is concerned about the work and person of Jesus Christ, and who loves the church. So for John, he is the embodiment. Gaius would be the embodiment of one who loves the brethren, which is a mark of salvation. And those who love Jesus Christ love his word. Look at Second, second John. In 2 John, he, he, he captures this idea, and this is love, verse 6 of 2 John, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard it from the beginning, that you should walk in it. And verse 7 goes on then to say, for many deceivers, these schismatics, have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, This is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Now now again, central to this is not only the idea of that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh, but that he therefore is not the Savior, which then takes us into a works-based form of righteousness, which we found to be present in the teaching of the false teacher in Colossae. Do not touch, do not taste, remember? It was works. So part and parcel of this, too, is the undermining of the sufficiency of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Because if he's not the God-man, he cannot be who he is in the context of being able to atone for sin and pay the price. John talks about the importance of that because John uses the word in his first epistle, propitiation, right? Right? That's an important idea. That's something else that's also under attack in the Gnostic teaching by undermining who is Jesus Christ. And so for us today, and in conclusion, I'll say, we want to be encouraged. We live in an age in which the truth is under attack. We're being fed all types and forms of different ideas about Jesus Christ. We're attacking the holiness of Jesus Christ. Implying or directly stating that he sinned or could sin, which which impacts his impeccability. There's much that's going on in the rejection of Jesus Christ. And so we want to be encouraged by the fact that John writing to Gaius back so many years ago, 2,000 years ago, that he, as a pastor, loved this man because he loved the truth, as we'll find out in further detail, and that John also loved him in the truth, loved him in Jesus Christ. Their bond was in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is everything. Jesus Christ is everything. It is core to the fellowship of the body of Christ. It is core to our relationship with each other. And the reason that it is core is because what we are called to then do is to live out the reality of our conversion by being people then who would be concerned about the truth and guarding the truth and protecting each other from error. That's so very important. So keep that in mind as we work through this and understand what John is talking about here as it relates to the truth and our love for the truth. And I ask you this question, do you love the truth? Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you love what the Word of God has to say about who Jesus Christ is? As a redeemed person, it ought to be the greatest treasure that you have. 
to revel in the wonder of the finished work of Jesus Christ, to know that he was actively obedient for me, that my highlight reel for my life is nothing about John Tucker, but all about Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and do not know Jesus Christ, then my challenge to you is stop rejecting the truth. Stop rejecting Jesus Christ because that's what you're doing. Look to Jesus Christ. And again, it, it begs this question, and I've asked it before, the idea of, of knowing Jesus Christ. It's one thing to know about him, but it's one thing to know him in the context of saving faith, a faith that falls into and rests fully on what Jesus Christ has done alone for you. A confident faith, a hopeful faith, a trusting faith, a resting faith. It's not faith if you're saying to yourself, well, I can make it, I can do it. I like Jesus Christ. I know about him. I think he was a good man. Well, the Gnostics would say that in part about him. Oh, he was a decent person. He just wasn't the God-man. Keep in mind what John said about those people. Don't even let them in your home and don't even say hi to them. So, I say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ today, call upon his name and you shall be saved. Examine your heart. What are you confident in? What are you trusting in right now? Is it truly Jesus Christ, the truth? Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for this exhortation from this little epistle. Thank you for the good reminders about the truth and the importance of it and our treasuring of it. Help us, Lord, to learn by examples that are given to us. By your providence, we here in Beloit, Ohio today, some 2,000 years later, know about a man named Gaius. And what we know about him is that John loved him and that John loved him because Gaius loved the truth. He loved Jesus Christ, and they had that common bond. Thank you for these great examples. May we be encouraged and convicted by them. Help us to press on. Help us to rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And may we serve Christ with a heart that is full of gratitude and delighting in the things that he has called us to do because he has done so very, very much for us. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen.